um, today, as many of you will know, we are going to be looking at a painting by Peter Paul Rubens um, from around 1609 to 1610 um, called Samson and Delilah. And it's a painted on panel, it's an oil painting on panel, and it's roughly around two meters wide by almost two meters high, so it's roughly square. Um, so I'm just going to um, start by sharing an image with you, which is not the painting itself. This is a painting by an, another 17th century artist from, from Flanders. So um, Rubens was a Flemish artist, so he was um, sort of based in the, the southern Netherlands. And um, this, this painting is by an artist called Franz Franken the Younger, and it was painted in about 1630 to 1635. And it shows one of these quite sort of typical scenes um, of a sort of Flemish interior um, of a house in Antwerp, um, which was owned by a man called Nicholas Rocox. And this was quite common at this time to, uh, to paint interior scenes like this. And often collectors commissioned paintings like this just so they could kind of memorialize their collection, if you like. And um, that's exactly what we see here. We see this group of rather wonderful men crowded around a circular table. Um, one of them's being poured another glass of wine. I have a feeling they're eating oysters, but I can't quite tell. Uh, but it looks like a, a very um, a groaning lunch table. Um, and you can see someone else coming through the door bringing a platter of, of more, more food. Um, we have a lovely little group in the corner playing their musical instruments and then this roaring fireplace at the centre of the composition. Um, and then of course around it is um, uh, our, our number of works of art. We have some antique busts up there on the left hand side on the, on the shelf um, and, and in the niche above the doorway. And then we have some paintings rather um, amusingly hung kind of in every nook and cranny of this wonderful, um, this wonderful house. Um, and significantly, we can see at the center of the painting, above the fireplace, there is the painting that we're gonna be looking at this evening, which is Samson and Delilah by Peter Paul Rubens. Now, this was a commission by, from Nicholas Rocox, who was a very sort of um, senior official in Antwerp and he commissioned Rubens to paint this painting. He was the mayor of Antwerp, he was what was known as the Burgomaster um, and he was a very good friend of Rubens too. So just to give you a, a potted history of Rubens before we move on to the picture itself, um, I thought this would be quite a fun picture to leave on the screen so you can just continue to enjoy it. Um, so Rubens was uh, born in 1577 in Western Germany in a place called Saigon um, his parents were actually both from the Southern Netherlands, but they moved to, to Germany because his father was a Calvinist and he was sort of driven out because at this point, the Southern Netherlands was a Catholic, um, a Catholic uh, uh, region and the Dutch Republic, which was sort of the Northern Netherlands, um, was Protestant. So there was this continual uh, kind of battle between um, the North and the South, which we'll continue to talk about. But his family uh, moved to Germany and after his father died, when Rubens was just 10 years old, um, they moved back to Antwerp. Around the age of 13, he, he starts painting, he starts training as an artist. And we know that he trained with, certainly trained with three artists and, and spent substantial periods of time in, in specifically two of their studios. Um, and one of whom was really the leading, an artist called Otto van Veen was really one of the, the leading artists in Antwerp at the time. Um, so he's, he's, he's um, admitted to the Guild of St. Luke, which was the artist's guild in Antwerp in 1598. Um, and after that, in 1600, he decides to go to Italy. So he's done his artistic training and it's a sort of early grand tour, if you like, to go to Italy and to explore the um, antiquities and the treasures of not only um, ancient Rome, but also the Renaissance. And this, of course, continues throughout history that Italy is this kind of um, epicenter of artistic and visual culture. 
So in 1600, he goes to uh, Venice initially, and then he is employed by a very um, significant noble, a man called um, Vincenzo Gonzaga, who was the Duke of Mantua. And um, Mantua was a, a leading um, a power in Italy in, in, the, in the 17th century. And he's employed by him really for eight years. But during this time, um, he kind of, he visits Florence, he goes down to Rome. In 1601, he's in Rome. In 1603, he's sent by the Gonzaga to Madrid to deliver some gifts to uh, the Duke of Lama, who's the prime minister there, um, some, some paintings. And then he returns to Rome. He's commissioned a very, um, one of his major altarpieces, early altarpieces in Rome in 1605. And his brother meets him there and they, they, they start collecting antiquities themselves. So one thing to note really in this early point is quite how much of a polymath Rubens was. He wasn't just a painter. He was um, a, a, a collector, a humanist, a scholar, um, he spoke several languages. He more often than not signs his name um, Pietro Paolo. Um, he, he, he very much aligned himself with, the, um, with Italian culture. Um, and he, he was also significantly a diplomat, which we'll, we'll talk about later on when, when we've looked at the picture. Um, but in 1608, his mother becomes ill and he and his brother are called back to Antwerp. And sadly, he gets back before he gets back after she's, she's already died. Um, but he, he gets back to Antwerp having had this in, incredible training uh, in Italy and, and sort of self, self teaching, lots of commissions, um, studying the, the antiquities and the masters of the Renaissance. And he arrives back in Antwerp and in 1609 is a very significant year for him. 1609 was the year that he married his first wife, Isabella Brandt. Um, who he, he stays married to until 1626 and was, was um, a, a great, great love and passion of his. Um, he, he also becomes court painter to the, Duke, the Archduke and Archduchess um, of the Southern Netherlands, which is, of course, a huge honour. I mean, the greatest honour, really. They were the governors, the Habsburg rulers of the Southern ne Netherlands, um, which at this point was ruled by Catholic Spain. Um, so the Spanish um, Archduchess Isabella became his close confidant and, um, and patron now. So we're, we're in 1609, 1610. Rubens is back in Antwerp. He's had a huge amount of, of training in Italy and he really has a huge career ahead of him. This painting depicts the Old Testament story of Samson and Delilah, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, I certainly remember learning about Samson when I was at school. Um, and we have Samson sort of slumped in slumber in the center of this composition. Um, and Samson was famous really for his strength. Um, he was an Israelite and uh, the, the, the story goes that his strength came from his hair. And this scene shows Samson with Delilah, who is a Philistine, but a lover of Samson. Samson had several uh, Philistine lovers, um, Delilah being the most significant. And after this massacre of a thousand Philistines, um, the Philistines asked Delilah, to betray him, um, she was the lady that Samson was in love with, and to find out how he has this strength and how can they overcome him. So uh, she does this, she deceives him and she, she seduces him and she discovers that the strength um, of Samson lies in his hair and orders an attendant, as we can see in the, in the middle of the composition there, to cut his hair um, in order for him to, to, to lose his strength. And he is then uh, captured by the Philistines and blinded and, and imprisoned um, before he then overcomes them sort of towards the end of his life by pulling down the temple once his hair's grown back and killing um, an assembly of Philistines and, and himself as well. So we have this wonderful composition that, that sort of the first thing just to look at the painting in a kind of very basic sense is to look at this 
diagonal thrust from the bottom right hand corner to the left hand corner where all the action is condensed in that left corner and then in the right hand corner we can see this little aperture um, this doorway and there are four or five soldiers um, peering into the house ready to to capture Samson once he's um, his hair has been has been cut it's a particularly interesting uh, painting to be looking at following last week's session where we looked at a painting by Caravaggio, which was painted uh, only a matter of years before this, um, obviously in, in Italy. Um, but the first thing to note in this painting is the presence of antiquities. So we saw that Rocox had a number of his own antiquities. We know that Rubens was a great collector of antiquities and gemstones. Um, and we can see not only the sculpture in the background in this niche, the sculpture of Venus with her son Cupid, the god of erotic love, um, which of course is a reference to the to the what's going on in the foreground. Um, but you know he's sort of clinging, clinging, clinging to her leg. It's almost kind of a, a sculpture that's come alive, brings brings great sort of um, vivacity to the back of the composition. Uh, but is of course a reference to to the antique, to Rubens' learning, to his collection, um, and to to the collection of Rocox. If we go to the left, this lovely brazier again, a kind of antique brazier with this fire burning in it. And on the bed, it, there are even antique references in these sort of horse heads. These are all kind of motifs that um, would have been taken from ancient visual culture. So initially, we have this reference to antiquity. Um, but I think uh, let's not sort of skirt around the elephant in the room and let's talk about Samson. Let's talk about the figure at the centre of the composition, um, which is Samson, as I say, asleep. He's been sort of um, plied with wine and he's, um, from the look of Delilah, also um, indulged himself in a number of other ways. And he's, 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 uh, he's asleep at the centre of the composition. But of course we are drawn to this incredibly muscular back, um, this sculpted torso. Now, this is um, a direct quotation of a very famous sculpture that was in Rome um, and was continually returned to by, by a number of artists, particularly during the Renaissance, including Michelangelo. Um, and this is called the Belvedere Torso currently in the Vatican Museums and it really is just a torso there are sort of it's sort of um, truncated at the knees and there are no arms and, and he or head so it is just this very muscular ancient Greek sculpture um, of, a, of a male torso and this this is a, a real quotation of that at the same time he's in Italy he's also of course looking at um, uh, Michelangelo, he's looking at the Sistine ceiling, um, this, this um, celebration of, of naked flesh um, and, and male anatomy, which, um, which we see sort of develop so much in the early 16th century. Um, the figure of Delilah is also a reference to, um, it's often stated that it's a reference to a sculpture by Michelangelo um, on the tomb of Lorenzo de' Medici in Florence. Um, a sculpture, a personification of night, and uh, there's there's a, a strong reason to think that is the reference. I also feel it's a, a strong reference to an ancient sculpture um, of Ariadne, a sleeping Ariadne, um, with these crossed legs, um, this very kind of uh, sort of sculptural, um, very um, considered um, crossing of the legs. Um, and the, the way in which her neck is arched around is also a reference perhaps to a, a, um, a composition of Leda and the Swan by Michelangelo. So there are these kind of hidden, hidden references um, in there. Another artist who, of course, uh, Rubens would have perhaps even encountered in Rome um, would have been Caravaggio. Now, this first decade of the 17th century is when this effect of chiaroscuro, this light and dark, is really coming into its own and the proponent and the, the trailblazer is Caravaggio who is in Rome in these years, um, these early years of the 17th century. And Caravaggio is known, as we, we discussed last week, for his um, dramatic and theatrical use of light. And we see 
Rubens sort of ingeniously employing light in this picture. Now, not only is there this very soft, warm glow of light, which is sort of bathing the entire bottom left corner, um, but there are these independent light sources, which we'll have a look at. But what's wonderful about the glow is that, of course, Rubens would have known that this picture was to hang above a fireplace. So we know that there was this kind of gentle flicker that was going to be coming from below. Um, and so he, he gives this sort of soft um, light to the composition. The brazier and the candle being held by the old lady, they are both blowing sort of to the right. Um, and that is probably because there were the windows, as we pointed out in the, in the space, that may have been open and may have sort of blown a breeze into the room. So he's really co composing this picture based on its physical location. But these independent light sources, the brazier on the left, the candle being held by the old lady, um, which sort of lights up the, the cheek of the, of the uh, barber at the center of the composition. There's a tiny little light um, just here at the back, um, just beneath the Venus. Um, and then of course you have this wonderful flickering torch um, lighting up the, the, the faces of these uh, very sort of uh, frightening looking Philistine soldiers. Rubens has encountered a, a, a German artist called Adam Elzheimer in Rome um, during these years and become very friendly with him and he's absolutely in awe of Elzheimer. Elzheimer typically does paintings very small on copper but they're very close friends and they sort of they, they sort of bounce compositions between one another, but Rubens does them on this grand scale and, and Elzheimer does these tiny little coppers. But Elzheimer is known for his night depictions, but also this amazing flickering um, light and, um, and fire. And I think you really get that there. And also this torch being held by the guards as well. Um, so the light isn't the only thing that Rubens is picking up from um, Caravaggio. Uh, just have a look at the feet here um, of Samson, these kind of grubby feet, which he starts to use in these early paintings. He, he does the same in two major altarpieces he does for Antwerp Cathedral. And the old lady, the old lady often appears in works by Caravaggio. And here um, she has a, a sort of slightly redundant um, role in this composition and we can only really assume that she's there as a sort of reflection or quotation of the Delilah figure um, and as we discussed with the Holbein this kind of this reminder of age and vanitas and life being finite and um, the, the almost identical profile of the two and the almost identical gaze of the two um, and this sort of, these sort of toothless kind of smirk and, and um, compared to the sort of voluptuous lips of the Delilah, um, you get a sense of the fact that Delilah is going to age. She will not remain youthful and beautiful forever. Delilah is of course betraying her lover. And, and I think that to remind her or, or to at least have this reminder that, you know, ha how she got herself into this situ situation, i.e. beauty and seduction, will not last forever. Thank you very much all for coming and for being so well behaved and being on mute. Um, and we will see you in two weeks time.